Since roughly 2008, the rate of seismicity in North America has increased dramatically. The population rightfully says, what's going on? Why are we feeling ground motion when we've never felt it before? If we can understand what's happening, we can understand how to solve it. And this induced seismicity question is solvable. When sediments are deposited in oceans and lakes and streams, and then they're buried in time and depth and pressure, they become rocks. When you bury them at depth and put a lot of pressure, they break. We call that a fault, a fault in the earth. Those fault planes can move against one another, and when rocks move, it causes an earthquake, and we call that seismicity. And they're all different scales, little teeny micro faults to major fault systems like the San Andreas Fault System out in California, and the cause major earthquakes. It's important to understand that earthquakes occur almost everywhere. We think of earthquakes mostly along the boundaries between, you know, where the giant plates slide past each other. But in fact, earthquakes occur within continental interiors all the time. It may seem unusual, but it's a totally natural process. Induced seismicity occurs when we perturb the natural system. So induced seismicity is seismic activity that can be related to a human cause. So you already have a fault. That fault is going to produce a, an earthquake at some time in the future, maybe not for hundreds of years, maybe not for thousands of years. But if you change the pressure of the fluid that's in the little cracks and pores in the rock, you make it easier for the earthquake to occur. In a sense, you're advancing the clock. There are lots of different ways that historically seismicity has been induced or triggered. Possibly a reservoir was, you know, a dam was built, a reservoir was impounded, and earthquakes occurred. Changes in subsurface pressure by uh, well injections, mining. Although the causes of the activity have been known by scientists, it's only been in the last decade and really in the last five or six years that it's, that it's garnered attention in the media and, and that people have been affected and that caused it to be more than just a scientific issue because there were ties to various kinds of energy development. What's happened in the United States and to some degree in Canada starting in around 2005 is the occurrence of earthquakes associated with unconventional oil and gas development. Now most people think that the earthquakes are actually caused by the hydraulic fracturing. In fact, that very rarely occurs. The process of hydraulic fracturing absolutely cracks the rock and creates little teeny earthquakes, micro-earthquakes. There's probably two or three cases in the world that I know about where a hydraulic fracture was felt at the surface. The Alberta Basin of Canada is the most well-documented case where hydraulic fracturing induces earthquakes. So it is an issue, but it's a very small part of the overall story of induced seismicity in the U.S. It's a more common part of the story of induced seismicity in Canada because of the nature of the formations that are being produced. In the United States, of the thousands of earthquakes we've had in the last few years, probably only about 1% have been caused by hydraulic fracturing. The rest of them have been caused by injection of wastewater as a disposal technique. Today, Oil and gas activities are producing, as they always have, water. These old rocks that were buried essentially capture the ocean. The sediments keep the ocean in them. They become rocks and all the little holes are filled with salt water. But those oceans, when you drill a well and release that pressure, the, old, the water comes up the well bore along with, hopefully, oil and gas. You separate the oil and the water, you transport the oil and you sell it. That water, many millions of gallons per well, needs to be disposed of. As we have moved from a vertical well bore to horizontal well bores in a shale, we're handling more fluids than in the past. The liquid waste of human activities used to be dumped mostly into oceans and water bodies on the surface. Not a great idea. So now those liquid wastes are being disposed back into the rocks. Flowback water is taken to central disposal injection wells called EPA class two injection wells. And you drill a well 
but instead of producing things from it, you put things back into that well bore. It's being disposed of in intervals that are different from where the water came from in the first place. So that means there's a, a potential imbalance. Taking water from one place and putting it somewhere else in the subsurface then causes local increases in pressure that then find their way to potentially sensitive faults and cause them to rupture. You had activities in areas where people were living and feeling earthquakes that were shaking things off their shelves. They weren't of the size that generated tsunamis in the, in the Pacific Ocean, but they were large enough to be at least an annoyance and, and sometimes uh, more costly in the fact that there was small damage to houses or, or, or something uh, more extensive. This happened in Youngstown, Ohio. It happened in Guy, Arkansas. It happened on the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. So there was a real association between wastewater injection and an occurrence of induced seismicity, earthquakes occurring where they would not be normally seen. Now it turns out that the big story in the United States over the past uh, five plus years has been Oklahoma. And 70% of all the earthquakes occurring in the central and eastern United States have been occurring in Oklahoma. Oklahoma has moved from essentially no uh, induced earthquakes or induced seismicity a few years ago uh, to a thousand. The background rate for magnitude four earthquakes in Oklahoma before 2009 was one per decade and in late 2015 they were occurring daily. So just a tremendous acceleration of a natural process by this, this massive fluid injection. And so it was that, that public attention and media attention that really caused the need for the scientific community, industry, and then the state and federal regulators to try to come together to see if they could wrap their arms around the issue and find out what were the specific causes and what could be done to mitigate it. We're tasked with research. We can generate data to help learn what's happening. Regulators want that, the public wants that. And, and, and we want it so that we can gain a, a kind of a physics-based understanding of what's happening. So where we are now is we have a strong consensus across the scientific community as to physically what's happening and, and an understanding of how fluid pressures can trigger fault movement. To manage the problem, to reduce the risk, you do a different thing in every case. For example, if drilling through pre-existing faults and hydraulic fracturing is causing an earthquakes, such as in parts of Canada, you have to study the subsurface before you drill. You have to identify the faults that are there. If there's a, a fault that, that crosses the well, you just skip a few of the, the frac stages, and then you avoid pressurizing the fault. If we're producing a lot of water that's gonna be disposed of by deep water injection, try to avoid that you know, scenario and inject it in other units, it's not gonna produce potentially damaging earthquakes. And part of that comes from mapping that subsurface better, understanding the present day stress and strain state of the earth, and then finally understanding the amount of fluid that's going in so that you do not create a pressure condition that would cause an earthquake to happen. It will probably involve more wells uh, spread out in different places, geographically and geologically. In key areas such as Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and elsewhere, regulatory agencies have taken appropriate action and have started to curtail subsurface fluid injection and put other protections in place. In Oklahoma, they have been calling out specific disposal wells and have ordered an increasing number of wells to cut back their injections of wastewater by increasing amounts. The rate of earthquakes immediately started to decline as soon as the volumes of saltwater disposal began to decline. There are other things that also can and should be done. One is to maximize the recycling of um, water produced from oil and gas into other um, oil, oil and gas wells. 
Nationwide, there's over 800 billion gallons a year of wastewater that comes up with oil and gas. The more that water can be recycled into other wells, the more pressure it takes off of the amount of water that needs to be disposed of in the first place. I'm very optimistic that, uh, that this problem is solvable. And we're already seeing great progress. We're seeing great progress on the research side, that there's strong consensus as to what's going on. We're seeing that some of the uh, regulatory actions are, are having an impact. We're seeing that, uh, that operators are starting to adapt their practices, and that's having an impact. But I think it's been very uh, rewarding to see over the last five or six years that the, some of those efforts have really uh, borne fruit and you see these coalitions of those different stakeholders um, really making headway and trying to understand the phenomenon and mitigate it and communicate with, with the public. I feel that within just a few years, we will have gotten on top of this problem and understand how to control it and we'll establish a framework that we can move forward.